Welcome to the MS Dev Show, episode number 161. This week, we talk with Josh Duty about resumes, interviewing, and salary negotiation, the Facebook algorithm mom problem, and an animated GIF embedded in bacteria. This episode of the MS Dev Show is brought to you by Aspose, the market leader of .NET and Java APIs for file business formats. Natively work with DocX, XSLX, PPT, PDF, MSG, MPP, image formats, and many more. Raygun gives you complete visibility on errors, crashes, and performance problems affecting your end users. Replicate issues in seconds rather than digging through log files or having to rely on users to report errors or crashes. Raygun gives you a window into how users are really experiencing your software applications. Check it out today at raygun.com. This week we have Josh Duty. He's a salary negotiation coach who helps software developers get more high quality job offers and negotiate higher salaries. How's it going, Josh? Pretty good. How are y'all? Very good. Very good. This is super timely because we had, uh, it was a couple episodes ago, we were, we were talking about terrible resumes and uh, terrible interviewers. And we thought that we would get somebody like you on to talk about how you actually should do this. Hopefully we can educate the masses and, and just improve this overall. I would love to see that. Sure. That sounds like fun to me. That's, uh, that's, that's where uh, my wheelhouse lives. So exactly. I'm ready. Perfect. Perfect. <laughs> Uh, Carl, what do we have for the comment of the week? Uh, this uh, week, we got the comment off of Twitter from Mikhail Shilkov, and he was responding to us when we did the episode on Cosmos DB. He said, the episode really felt like pure marketing. You guys should challenge your guests, especially Microsoft, to go over trade-offs and alternatives, trying to help. Um, and, and what I really liked about this comment is uh, your response, Jason, as well. Um, you know, while we did go over all the positives and we kind of missed some of those, uh, we, we personally got really excited about this and just kind of kept going into all the awesome things that it can do. Mm -hmm. And then Rima joined in later. She's like, yeah, we should have actually probably doubled the length and done a two hour episode to yeah. really get into this full topic. So, you know, a lot of times we do, well, we don't have a time frame that we deal with. Uh, we do try to keep it around an hour ish just to be somewhat consistent. Uh, but you know, we will definitely take that into consideration, take that to heart uh, for future interviews that uh, make sure that we kind of hit the, you know, the full rounded, uh, aspects of whatever we're talking about that day. Yeah. I mean, we just get excited about stuff that solves a problem for us. Right. Um, so, but, but you know, that's such a, that is a good point. We need to, we need to ask, uh, probably some, some harder questions. So we, uh, we definitely appreciate that feedback because we never want this to sound like marketing. I mean, we're always, we're just trying to get people excited about stuff. And I mean, but the, the worst part about that, you know, you get some excited about something and then, and then you run into issues right whenever you start using something that's no fun either. So, um, you know, people should go into this stuff, understanding what the, what the trade-offs are. So great, great feedback. And if you want to get mentioned on the show, uh, send us an email to feedback at msdevshow.com, comment on Facebook, YouTube, or Stitcher. We especially like those five-star iTunes reviews. Yes, we do. Okay, let's jump into the news. So the first one here, mastering programming. Yeah, so this uh, this gentleman who wrote this, Kent Beck, he said that he was kind of like looking at people who are, quote, master programmers and kind of noticed that there's like a few uh, patterns that he uh, kind of got from all of them. And as, as I was kind of reading his article and his synopsis, I realized that this isn't just for programming. This kind of really, you could take these generic high level skills and use this to, to master anything. Mm -hmm. In particular, he broke it down that there's kind of four main categories, time, learning, transcending logic and risk. And for example, time is you know, like understand time slicing, be able to break big things down into smaller pieces, do one thing at a time, uh, do the, you know, make easy changes. If there's something big and complex, make it easy. Mm -hmm. um, so on and so forth, you know, with these, so, you know, we'll, we'll let you read this full article, but I, you know, I really like that, you know, this is broken down in, in ways that have actionable steps that you can mm -hmm. learn from and kind of apply to your daily life. Yeah. I mean, I thought when, was, yeah. When I first look at it, I was like, this is kind of generic, but honestly, like, I think you should take a, a, a look through this because some of these things might just kind of open your eyes into something into a kind of a strategy that you haven't thought about. Uh, so yeah, this was, this was a great, simple, straight to the point, concise article. Especially if there's uh, if, if your one of your goals is to be a master programmer or mastering anything, mm -hmm. um, you know, it, it's really good to understand how do you master something. Mm -hmm. 
Absolutely. So next up, we got the Facebook algorithm mom problem. Yeah, so the, the person who wrote this article, uh, they're, they're trying to use Facebook as a way to get out, you know, their their message, especially when it comes to technical things. Mm -hmm. um, but we all have, you know, relatives on Facebook as well as, you know, the, you know, the community that we're trying to grow around us. And they noticed that uh, uh, a lot of times whenever their mom liked it or commented on it right away, that for some reason nobody was reading it. And after doing a little bit of research, it turns out that Facebook was realizing that, hey, this is your mom. Whenever you post something, even though that's this mathematical thing, it's highly technical, mom's going to like it anyways. Mm -hmm. But Facebook wasn't smart enough to realize that uh, it's not a family topic. So it's like, hey, I know that's your mom. It must be a family thing. I'm only going to show it to people who are your family members. Yeah. So what this person realized, and it was actually quite clever about, is that you can target who your message is. So you can send it to like certain groups, certain circles, and you can put exceptions on there. So they would say, send this to everybody except for my mom and my aunt, because even though they're awesome and like everything, the distribution isn't getting out of there. And all of a sudden the, the viewership on their posts went way up again. Mm -hmm. And lo and behold, mom was still liking them and aunt was still liking them because mom's gonna find all your stuff anyways. Yeah, this is I mean, this is a little frustrating because the the good news is Facebook, you know, has this this algorithm that's trying to get people information that they want to see or or that at least Facebook wants them to see. Uh, but on the other hand, <laughs> Facebook is trying to figure out what they want to see. Right. Like it's you know, it's this machine out learning algorithm that it isn't quite perfect. And if you want certain people to see something in particular, um, you know, you don't necessarily know how the algorithm works, so you don't know how to, you know, get it to the right people. Um, so I don't know this problem. I'm sure the algorithm like overall has a huge upside, but you definitely need to be aware of the of the the downsides there. And sometimes you have to play that a little bit. He also mentioned in here, too, uh, this this idea of, um, you know, I have my Twitter hooked up to my to Facebook and they, he was mentioning that they'll deprioritize those. And uh you know, I'll have I have all this tech related stuff come through through Twitter and most of the stuff I post on Facebook directly is all family stuff. And I asked everybody, I said, hey, do you guys mind the tech stuff? And I actually suspect that most of my friends don't even see the tech stuff, except for kind of the, the techie friends uh, that have commented and liked that kind of stuff. But I have a lot of non techie friends that I'm sure have never liked it and they've just scrolled right past it. So the machine learn, learning algorithm is saying, hey, these people are not interested in any of these things that, that are posted externally. Basically, if it comes from Twitter, never show it to them. Um, so it, again, it's kind of making that decision for you, which I think probably works fine 99% of the time, but it's good to be aware that this is going on and, and sort of be conscious of it if you want certain people to see certain things. And it's an interesting workaround that he has there. <laughs> any other comments on this one? Nope. Okay, well, what do we got next? Uh, this is wild. Scientists have inserted an animated, oh geez, GIF GIF of a horse <laughs> into living bacteria. <laughs> I, I mean, this is just uh, really interesting because a lot of times that you think of like genetic, you know, modifications, you think about, you know, mm -hmm. you know, the ways to improve an organism or to see what side effects or, or just learning in general. And, and here they actually found a way to encode an animated GIF into a DNA sequence, insert that into a living organism, and was later able to pull it back out in a fashion that wasn't 100%, but still more than enough to recreate and understand that original animated GIF that went in. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they're using and, like a, a virus to splice apart yeah. this genetic sequence and then insert their own data into there. It's very yeah, amazing. it's it's using a very powerful new technique called CRISPR. It's something that's been around for a little while, but has been uh, given it has given scientists some pretty powerful ways to do this DNA DNA modification. Yeah, I was telling Carl before the show, I was I watched the the video here, and it's just kind of hilarious because the guy's like looking at like petri dishes, and he's got like a Bunsen burner going, and he's like stabbing stuff into this other thing and then in but you know really then they show all this like molecular stuff going on and it's just kind of funny like the the juxtaposition of of like you know the kind of this high level stuff and it's like oh yeah we're encoding like computer data into into uh, dna sequences at this molecular level which is uh, which is pretty wild 
Um, so this will be the new way, right, for, for like, um, industrial espionage, right? Like, you go in. It's one of these places they don't allow, like, a USB thing. So you, you go in there and somehow encode the, the data into your genetic sequences or in, into the bacteria, and then you can sneak the data out. Is that the use for this, Carl? <laughs> <laughs> okay, maybe not. Maybe that's just me. Uh, employees who stay... Okay, this one's pretty good. Employees who stay in companies longer than two years get fifty get paid 50% less. And I figured, Josh, you'd be interested in commenting on this as well. Uh, so my two-year anniversary is coming up at work. So you're saying <laughs> I should start looking? Is that, is that what you're telling me, Jason? Yeah, if you stay any longer, you, you're just... You're done. You're done. All right. you've, you've maxed out at your at your current employer. Well, no, the, I mean, the, so the general idea is that, you know, it used to be frowned upon that you have these the job hoppers that would switch jobs because it was, I, I don't know, as, as humans, we we have this um, this strange connection with uh, things that, that really shouldn't have any connection, such as like the organization that, that you're working with. You know, so you're 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 working for a company and. You know, the company, if they don't need you anymore, like they don't hesitate to get rid of people. I mean, that's just the reality of business, right? Like it would be bad business if, if that wasn't the case. And I'm sure there's some companies out there that are, that are an exception. But then that also has a, you know, breeds kind of a toxic environment because it's like, hey, this person over here isn't doing any work and we're still keeping them employed. Um, so we have we have the, the environment from that direction where the again, the employer is not they don't hesitate to get rid of people but the employee feels like they have some kind of duty to actually stay at this at this company um you know even when there's like a better offer somewhere else um so you know the but the yeah so the 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 new environment out there now is uh you know to switch jobs every couple of years and when you are you know in this position where you're you're switching companies you have this opportunity to negotiate and the company, you know, there's a reason why they have the open position. Like they have a problem that they need to solve. And a lot of times money is is their only way of, of solving that particular problem. Uh, so I, th I think that kind of explains this, uh, uh, you know, why somebody who is switching jobs and kind of negotiating the whole way is going to make quite a bit more money. So I don't know if you, what, what comments you have, Josh. Yeah, I, uh, I was surprised to see this article pop up again because it was, I think it's actually a couple of years old. So oh, really? when I saw it, I was I, Oh, I, yeah, I, it's from I, June 22nd, 2014. How, how yeah. timely of us. Interesting, right? That it cycled <laughs> back. To, well, no, I mean, it's, it was, I, I'm not at all surprised that we're talking about it because it right. made a, you know, I saw it all over Twitter, all over Facebook, on LinkedIn. People were sharing it. So I don't, I'm not sure. There must have been some event where somebody punched it back into gear. Yeah. Um, but probably not a coincidence that it's been, you know, a little over two years since this last <laughs> made the rounds. Maybe somebody's getting a little antsy. Um, <laughs> I, I think um, there's a quote that I always mangle, but it's something like, uh, you know, don't don't attribute to malice what can be attributed to incompetence. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I think incompetence is a strong word here. But my theory on why this happens is actually more just related to the inertia that's inside a large organization, right? Mm -hmm. And that is that, when you're hired, um, just like just like we were just talking about, you are solving a specific problem that a business has at that time. Mm -hmm. uh, they have some idea what the value of that problem is and how much they're willing to pay to solve it by hiring a person or you know maybe sometimes buying a tool or whatever that is. Um, and then so they do market research and they say, well, in order to hire this mid-level software developer, we're going to have to carve out $120,000 and that's just what it's going to cost. And then the developer might negotiate or might not. They've done some market research in that real time. And then they figure out, you know, sort of what the value of that uh, position is and they bring the person on and they start working. Once they've started working, the machinery of the business kicks into overdrive but on different activities like actually doing the thing that they hired the person to do or building new products or doing market research. Uh, the hiring manager is off to hiring other people. And so they don't actively do sort of real-time research on you know, how much should this person be paid right now? They're not pinging, you know, every month going back and doing, you know, a poll to say, how much should they be paid? How much should they be paid? Yeah. And so over time, everybody just kind of forgets about it and it just deprioritizes. So they're just not keeping up with market conditions and things that are changing. So I think, you know, for software developers and people in quote unquote tech, this is, um, I wouldn't say a problem, but it's something that needs to be uh, focused on by the employee because it becomes the employee's responsibility to keep an eye on market conditions, to figure out what their value is to the organization, um, to understand what they could uh, command in a salary if they went to another organization. Um, because HR, hiring managers, directors, businesses just aren't focusing a lot of their energy on trying to figure out day to day, how much is this employee worth to us right now? 
And so it just kind of falls off the radar. And I think that's all it is, is it's just not a priority once they get hired. They've made the deal and now they're just doing the work and everybody's off doing their, yeah. their and, day job. And they so got them. It's like, we, we, you're already working here. Man, that's, that's super right. insightful. I, I never thought about that, that the employer, before, you, before they fill the position, they are going through all this work of, of figuring out what, what the value is to them. Like, we're going to spend this money, we're going to solve this problem, and that's worth it for us. And then once you're in that role, it becomes this thing where like, you know, what is the minimum bump that we can give this person and, and like keep well, them? You know, and, I, I don't even think it, it, there's even that much thought. I think a yeah. lot of times, you know, like, okay, we have a budget. This is how much this department gets. Yeah, and uh, next year, next year, it's going to raise by 5%. You know what? So yeah. everybody gets to split that 5%. Somebody gets seven, right. somebody gets two. It, it, it all works yeah. out to that, That's ma- a good point. that magic percentage yeah. and the person who gets that two percent actually gets hosed if the inflation rates three because then you're right. getting a raise but making I, less yeah yeah, and yeah that I, department I, might might have made themselves more valuable over that time too but you know it's, it's kind of the same problem like you can think of that as a person as well and they're not they're not getting the increase that, that they deserve especially when we're talking about software or it and like we've i think over i think it's pretty hard to debate the fact that like you know it and software groups I would think in organizations, um, it hasn't been a linear growth in value to the company, right? I think it's gone up probably exponentially or at least outpacing that linear growth, but they probably want to keep increasing the budget on a linear basis because that's the way business works. Yeah, because it's easy to do that, right? Right. Like, you know, we have, you know, 10% year over year growth. So, you know, or whatever that is. Yeah. Um, and I do think, I think it's just a matter of, you know, priorities and, uh, and the effort required I me, mean, it takes a lot of energy. You know, if, if you've ever changed jobs and tried to figure out like how much should I get paid when I change jobs, it takes time and it takes energy and you have to do research and you have to do some guessing and you know, you have to figure it out. And so if you think from the inside of a company, like how hard it would be to keep up with all the numbers for all the yeah. different pay grades and jobs and responsibilities, um, it would be just a ton of effort. Um, I've only worked at one company that I could remember where HR would proactively look at market rates for different positions and reach okay. out to hiring managers and say, hey, just so you know, uh, Tim is about 20% below market right now. And so we think he's an attrition risk, right? Yeah. Um, and, and we need to talk about adjust, maybe not 20% increase on his salary, but we need to talk about how we can get him closer to market parity so he doesn't go away. Um, mm-hmm. But most companies just don't invest the, the time and energy there. And so salaries just kind of slip off over yeah. time. Yeah, that responsibility shifts, right? It's, it goes from the employer to all of a sudden the employee has to like continually prove their their worth, and and you obviously have to be aware of that um, because if I don't I don't think you're necessarily going to convince your company that hey, I I I don't want to keep convincing you my value. I want you to keep doing it for me, and I don't think that strategy is going to work. No, it doesn't work very well. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Very interesting. So, I mean, let's, that was this is actually a good segue. I mean, we'll just we'll just kind of transition into this. But um, the 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 reason that this this whole conversation came up and the whole reason that we wanted to have you you on as a guest is um, I was doing some interviews and I got some terrible resumes and and I don't know. I guess I have pretty high. Standards. Did mine get slipped in that pile? <laughs> yeah, I, I yeah. guess. <laughs> yeah, Carl's was the worst. We're, we'll, <laughs> we'll post a link in the show notes of like what not to do. Uh, no, um, you know it, it's interesting because I you know and these were like some of them were were good people. You know they they were people that knew what they were doing and and I suspect part of it is they just don't spend a lot of time on their resume and I also have pretty high standards. Like I actually. Um, in the past have helped a lot of people with their resumes and, and tried to, you know, kind of increase the impact of, of, uh, of how they were, they were selling themselves. Um, but man, just some were terrible and you know, there's, there's spelling mistakes and I, I can actually like this whole thing where you see like one spelling mistake, like throw it out. I don't know if I see a good resume with like one spelling mistake, like, okay, I can probably overlook that. But the problem is like the resume is terrible and there's four spelling mistakes and it just, I just, Oh, it just enrages me. It's just, it's just terrible. So, um, like how do you, you know, in, in developer, I don't know if it's developers are statistically worse, worse at this, but let's pretend like that statistic I just made up is true that developers are, are worse at writing resumes. Um, so, so like how, how do we solve this? What do our listeners do? Cause you know, probably half of them have terrible resumes. I'm sorry, listeners, uh, <laughs> <laughs> but you probably do, um, statistically speaking on the statistics that I just made up. So how do we solve this? I think, you know, for me, and maybe you can confirm this since you're looking at resumes right now, but I think it might, 
when I talk to my clients as I'm coaching people through this and they send me a resume to look at it, mm-hmm. what I do um, when I'm going to review somebody's resume is I'll either jump on a call with them or I'll fire up ScreenFlow so I can record my screen while I do it. I will not look at their resume and then I'll pull it up on my screen and just real oh, time talk to them. And the then resume. react, yeah. That's right. <laughs> and the reason I do that is because as a hiring manager, that's a good YouTube time channel. When you're because there's always yeah. like kids react to. So it's like, yeah, it could yeah, be like, it, it could oh, be no, like Jason happening? reacts to resumes. <laughs> Why is this written in crayon? Yeah. Um, so I, I think, you know, the, you ha- the reaction is the important part because as a hiring manager, for me, I, I don't know if this is true for everybody. What would happen almost always is I would be, you know, because you're in interview or hiring mode, right? You've got mm-hmm. one or two positions you're trying to fill. And so you're spending some time on interviewing, but you're also still doing your job. And so you get a, the 15 minute outlook reminder that says, Hey, by the way, you have a, an interview coming up in 15 minutes. And you're like, Oh shoot, I totally forgot about that. Let me see if I can wrap this up real quick. Um, <laughs> okay. <laughs> Never you, happens. You search for the person's <laughs> name in your email. You look yep. for that email from HR that has the PDF of the resume attached, or you go to the share drive or whatever you're looking for to see where the resume is. By the time you get the resume and if you print it or you don't and you get it up in front of you, Oh no, it's time to make that phone call. So you try to find the phone number and now you're scrambling to call them on time. Now they're answering the phone. I just got that resume up in front of me and oh, hello, Tim. Uh, it's so nice to meet you. I see that. And then now you're scanning the resume looking for something to talk about. So yeah. that's how every interview started with me. I'd like, to, I'd like to say that I would sit down and I would just you know, comb through the resume word by word and just really get you know, a, you know, a glass of wine in one hand and a resume in the <laughs> other hand. But the reality is you just jump on the phone and you start talking to the person yeah. and you start skimming the resume real time, trying to figure out who they are, what's their background, how experienced are they. Um, and so when I coach people on resumes, I say, look, you need to, that's the use case that you're writing for. Aside from all the sort of keyword scanning algorithm stuff that, you know, I think it's less popular now, but was popular for a while. Um, that's, I think that's a different beast and we can talk about that. I think it's mm-hmm. less interesting, but the, how does a hiring manager react to your resume and what do they get from it? So the first thing is it needs to be skimmable. I need to be able to literally pick it up real time while I'm talking to you, skim it and get a basic idea of who you are and what you're up to, what's your background. What have your previous jobs been? Where did you go to school if you're you know, out of school a few years? Um, so that's the first thing. The second thing is that I need to be able to see pretty easily what you've done experience-wise with what technologies. And I need to understand what you know about the business value of the stuff that you do. And so it's one thing to just list off two pages of bullet points on projects that you worked on or something. But what I want to know is that when you worked on those projects, were you aware of how your work impacted the business? Um, because as a hiring manager, if I can hire somebody who can do good work and understands the business value of what they're doing, I know that they can do a lot of prioritizing their work. So they're working on the stuff that's important to me. They can do better reporting for me. They'll get better business results from the stuff they're mm-hmm. doing because they're thinking, you know, one step ahead. Um, so those are the two things is one, it just needs to be generally skimmable so I can see who you are and what you've done Two, I need to be able to at least see in some of those bullet points, not all of them, but some of them where you say, you know, um, you know, built application in this technology. I need to say to accomplish whatever it was for the business, to mm-hmm. help the group become more efficient with scheduling, to help close more deals or whatever that is, mm-hmm. um, and what the result was. So those are those are kind of my two guiding principles with resumes: is skimmable and demonstrates that they understand business value of what they're doing. So I know you said that you know you wanted it wasn't as interesting, but do we kind of need like two different resumes, one to get our foot in the door past the HR person who is doing that, you know, keyword search, and then one for the hiring manager who needs that, you know, that history, the understanding that you know what your value is and what you can uh, bring to the table? Maybe. So so I thought you were going to say something that you didn't say, and I was ready to answer that question. I thought you were going to ask if we should have two resumes, one that's sort of your master resume with all your stuff, and then one for each opportunity, which the answer to that, I think, is yes. So um, I think it's okay to have a you know a six-page master resume that has everything that you've done, and then you apply for a position, and you say, you know what, I can cut out these two pages of stuff because this company mm-hmm. doesn't care about that stuff. Um, I don't know that I would go to the trouble personally. I can only speak personally here. I don't know if I would go to the trouble of creating like a resume for Microsoft and then a resume that's pared down or different from for the hiring manager who I'm going to look to. I would rather just give Microsoft that hiring manager resume. Here's why. In my experience, most people who are getting jobs, especially software developers now, sometimes they're getting jobs from like cold calls from uh, staffing recruiters or they're submitting applications and resumes online. But almost always it's because they know somebody at Microsoft or they know somebody at the company that they're going to and they reach out to them and say, hey, listen, I know that your experience with this technology, uh, we need somebody like that. Are you looking for work, right? Or they're just, you know, at happy hour and they, they mention offhand, you know, but you know, by the way, I've been freelancing for two years, but I'm thinking about going back to a day job. Uh, I'm a Ruby on Rails developer or whatever it is. Um, 
do you have anything for me? And so that first layer of the resume usually just isn't as useful, that one that's you know jammed with keywords that gets scanned by algorithms. And the reason is on the flip side, most companies aren't hiring from the pile of resumes that they scan into their machine anyway. Um, so I think if you if I had to pick there, I would choose the one that you would optimize for the hiring manager. That's the one that I would have ready to go and ready for the company. Because a lot of times mm -hmm. you're going to go straight to the hiring manager anyway through a referral program. I mean, that's you know every company now has a referral program, right? You you send us a referral, mm -hmm. and if we hire them, you get two thousand dollars or four thousand dollars or whatever it is. Um, and so there's a lot of direct contacts and warm leads that are being generated where they're passing along a resume that should hopefully be optimized for that company and for the hiring manager in position already. And that certainly helps filter out the the companies that do the keyword scanning. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I like I said, it feels like I don't know if they're still doing it, but it feels like it was kind of a fad. And I'm just not, I, I'm not seeing a lot of people who I are getting so. jobs by by just chucking out resumes everywhere. Right. So I, you know, I wouldn't spend a lot of time with companies that I feel like the only way to get in is to send them a resume with keywords all over it. Yeah. Aspose offers a powerful set of file management APIs with which developers can create applications, which can create, open, edit, and save the majority of popular business file formats. Their product range supports a multitude of file formats, including Word documents, Excel spreadsheets, PowerPoint presentations, PDF documents, OneNote, Outlook, Project, Visio files, popular image formats, and many others. Aspose produces APIs for .NET, Java, and the cloud, which can be utilized in almost any modern language available today. Visit Aspose.com for a free 30-day no limitations trial, and if you get stuck, message the friendly support team for help. All technical support is offered free of charge. And remember, if you are a lucky winner, you will receive a free developer small business license for Aspose.net, a powerful toolkit for working with Word documents in your applications. Yeah. So, you know, you know, one of the things I was thinking about, like, why are resumes so bad? I remember when I was in high school and college, you know, we all had to take that class like you have to write a resume and have it be done. Right. And I remember going through there and they were always telling us like, don't use any colors on there. They have to be, you know, you use black only and you should put thing, you should put the keyword list and you should put your work history list in this order and, and, and go down and on and on the line. And that seemed really counterintuitive to me at least. And then I remember like in, in the one college class, for example, they just took all of our resumes and threw them on the table and like, which ones stand out? And it was always people who broke the rules, the people who, who used color, the people who used alternate formattings, the people who told stories in their in, in, in their resumes. So what, what can we do to kind of like break that educational thing or to let people know that maybe some of that stuff that you've been told about resumes isn't isn't accurate? Pink paper and scented. <laughs> yeah, you'll stand out that was for a movie sure. Reference. <laughs> <laughs> um, I didn't Sorry. get that movie reference. Interesting. Um, it was from the what, second Legally Blonde movie. <laughs> well, I'm, uh, I feel okay. Which you're an expert on. I feel fine. Yeah. I'm fine with that. Uh, if it was like a Matrix reference, I would feel pretty yeah. bad right now. Um, I think so. I would say proceed with caution with that. So I do think that there's room. I've seen some really good resumes. Usually, the resumes that I see where I care about design, or you know, I think design matters most is designers. So like UX designers, UI designers, and, and just, you know, graphic designers. Um, I think they are, are more equipped to do that well. Um, there is a risk that I think you run. So yes, you throw them all on the table and one of them stands out to you. The question is, when you pick it up, what do you see? Mm -hmm. And it might stand out because it's pink and scented or, you know, <laughs> it's written in crayon or something. And that's different than standing out because this is a competent person that I want to hire. And so I think it takes a certain amount of skill to design a resume that's appealing and will stand out on its own sort of design principles and faculties as opposed to just looking different. Um, and so I, because I work with developers, I sort of assume that they're not super comfortable with design. I'm certainly not super comfortable with design in a way that I would want to design a document that would um, you know, cause people to be interested in hiring me. So I, I tend to come from the school of thought that I'm okay with Times New Roman or Arial font um, I'm okay with pretty basic formatting that's black and white if I can skim it and if I can see that you understand the business value of the stuff that you're doing. Mm -hmm. I think that if you do design it so that it stands out and you do it well, I think that could be uh, that could pay off for you. Uh, if you're going to do that, it might be worth hiring a professional resume designer to actually do a good resume design for you as opposed to taking a shot yourself mm -hmm. because there's a good chance that if you don't have experience with that, you could you know design something that actually doesn't look that appealing. It stands out visually but could be unappealing you know, when you actually hold it and look at it. Yeah. My resume used to, I used to have, um, and, and it was, it was bad. So I'm going to call myself out on it. I used to have, you know, like 
uh, a technology section and I would kind of list everything. Right. And then it, and it was oh, just it's, I'm kind of cringing now because I see people still do it where you just have this thing and where you list and it goes. It's like at the end, it's like VB six and like, you know, office. It's not for, even bullets. It's just like a big paragraph. Yeah, and It's like office <laughs> office for DOS. And it's like yeah. we're not hiring for that. It's like, <laughs> I, I don't yeah. know if there are any copies of that still exist. Um, I mean, it, it's just it's just terrible. And, uh, you know, so the approach that I take and I, and I kind of want to get your take on this and let me let me know what you think. My approach now, you know, it, it is all about like business impact. So I think that's kind of the end. If I sort of tie these things together, it's like on one end, I've used C sharp. And at the other end, I've had this business impact and I want to tie those things together. So I would I would make a statement and I, I, I can't I'm not going to create a great one on, a, on the fly, but I would say, you know, increased sales by a million dollars by increasing the speed of this software by 10% uh, using, you know, some kind of algorithm in C sharp, um, you know, backed by an Oracle database. Like I would, I would put, you know, so it, the scanner would actually pick up on some of those keywords, mm -hmm. uh, but somebody reading it, they're going to see the business value and they're going to see how I did it. And I would also be very clear on the part that I did. Uh, that's, that's one thing that drives me crazy too, is like, I was on a team that did amazing work. Good for you. <laughs> like, right, you won right. the lottery. <laughs> Why yeah. do I care? What did you actually do? Right. Um, yeah, I think, I mean, I think you, first of all, I like the example that you gave, even mm. though you just kind of, you know, built it on the yeah. fly. I think um, to use that same example, you described the business value, how much business value and how you accomplished it. A lot of people would have stopped with, I designed a really cool algorithm in C++. Yeah. Which is boring. It, it doesn't exactly. tell me anything except that, you know, something, you know, enough about C++ to write that you did that thing. Yeah. Um, I think that putting the technologies in to your, you know, bullet points under your experience section is good, um, especially if you do it the way you described. Mm -hmm. I think it's also okay to have like a, a dedicated technology section on your resume. I think it's useful as a hiring manager if I can scroll down to the bottom of the second page and see like a basic list of the kind of stuff that you work on, uh, mm -hmm. especially for software developers. There's so many different flavors of software development now, um, and not yeah. even just you know your front end and back end and um, database and all that stuff, but there's, there's so many different stacks that you can work in now. So it, it helps mm -hmm. to be able to scan and say, yes, they work in the stack that we are hiring for. Okay. Um, but, uh, you said something I think that really does resonate with me and that I should have mentioned earlier, which is you also should make sure that the stuff you list on your resume is stuff that you want a job doing. Um, yeah. right. And so you're listening, you know, you have your BB six or whatever, this old stuff, you know, your, your office for DOS, like, Cobol. okay, great. We're actually hiring somebody to do office for DOS work. <laughs> <laughs> and you're like, well, well you know, I, I didn't I do that work, you know. So, you know, take it if it's on your resume because it shows like a, a certain technical competence that might be valuable to the manager you're talking to. Maybe I could let it slide. But if it's just this is literally a list of every technology that I've ever touched or have experience with, including, you know, PowerPoint, mm -hmm. um, that's not useful to anybody. And it will trip keyword things. But the problem is that you run a risk of, like I said, like you're talking to a hiring manager and they say, oh, I see you have experience with the uh, office for DOS. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's great. You know, um, when can you start? We want we need an office for DOS expert right now for this legacy system. <laughs> yeah. Going to be working out of a basement. And then your answer is, oh well, I don't actually want to do that job. I just wanted to tell you that I know the technology. Yeah. Now I as knew, a hiring manager, that I knew the technology. <laughs> I, I used to know it. And the hiring manager immediately is going to think, well, okay, so now I I have to question yeah. it. Literally everything on this resume. Is there anything on this resume that you actually Good would point. want a job to do? How do I figure out what that stuff is? Right. Um, so it's better if you just say the stuff on my resume is the stuff that I would like to get hired by this company to do. It's stuff that I'm proficient in. Um, maybe even indicate your level of proficiency. Um, that's one of the few design things I suggested um, when I talked to some developers last year at a, at a talk I gave was if you're not sure and you want to make sure that you communicate it, you could do like a little gas gauge or a red, yellow, green or something that says, you know, yes, I've touched this JavaScript framework, but I've only touched it one time for a toy project. I haven't built a production app yeah. in it. Right. Um, as opposed to like, I'm super experienced with this stack. I've built tons of production apps that have gone to web scale eventually, and I'm I, I can use it right now. Oh, I'll be. I would believe that resume. I mean, that's the great right. thing. Like you, you would think like, oh, geez, you know, we put red, you know, just like basic, you know, level of of understanding. But then the things that you put in green, I'm gonna be like, this is perfect. Like this, these are the things. Because you know, I was thinking about it. Um, one of the questions that I always have to ask, and it's it's really terrible that the resumes don't communicate this at all. I, you know, I have to be like, hey, what do you what like what technologies do you want to work on? Like, what are you working on now? And and do you like working in those technologies? And um, kind of my initial reaction right now would be if I were to if I were to update my resume, I would probably uh, put in I'd probably put it in kind of like the the about me section where, you know, I'd say, uh, you know, I'm a passionate developer that's, you know, 
uh, recently been, or I don't know how I would state it, but you know, currently focusing on C sharp line of business applications, um, and uh, you know, recently worked on you know Go in Azure or something. You know, I would I'd probably kind of point that out and and or, and maybe even make a statement. Now that I now that I heard from you, I might even make a statement that like that's the kind of work that I'm looking for, and hopefully that aligns to the the job that you're you're trying to get. But I would probably. Uh, include that in there because again as a as a hiring manager um that's that's one of the big things that i want to know is is this the type of work that you want to be doing and have you been doing it recently yep yeah i mean i think that's a, a great strategy i think emphasizing the stuff that you're doing right now especially if it's relevant to the company that you're talking to i mean ultimately what you're doing is your resume is your first step in the door to the interview mm -hmm. but kind of my overarching uh, philosophy is that you're telling a story about how the company will be better if you're a part of it yeah. And so it's hard to do that if you're telling them about all these technologies that they don't care about that you're experienced with, right? Yeah. But it's easy to do that if you say, like you just said, you know, I'm experienced with C Sharp or I'm working on, you know, in, in a cloud with these technologies right now and I want to do more of that work. Let me tell you about some of the projects that I've done. Then they're saying, okay, this is great. You've done, you basically just said you're qualified for this work and we just need to figure out if you're a good fit. Mm -hmm. um, so it makes it a lot easier if you can just focus them in on the stuff that you care about instead of just, you know, hitting them with every piece of data that you could possibly hit them with. Awesome. Okay, all of our listeners now have a perfect resume. They've all updated it. Uh, so now they, right. now they have some interviews. Okay, so uh, I guess step one, <laughs> what should they do to prepare for interviews? Yeah, so I think that the, the, the key stuff that you should do to prepare is really build sort of a, a mini dossier on um, the company that you're going to interview for. So we've already talked about sort of tailing your, your resume so that it looks appealing to the specific company that you're talking to or the hiring manager if possible. Mm -hmm. um, and so I, I describe this ultimately, I, I've kind of refined this over time, but I describe it as using positioning, which is sort of a marketing term, but you're positioning yourself as the candidate for the position that you're applying for. And so you do that with preparation, with research. So you want to make sure that you look up the company uh, online. If they're public, you know, read the first page of their last 10K, uh, which usually is very revealing because they'll say, here's what we're trying to accomplish in the next year. Here are our challenges right now. So that can be really great fodder for answering interview questions to say, I know what your challenges are and let me tell you how I will help with them. Um, understand how big the company is. Um, I like to it, have people look at the jobs page for the company and see what kind of people are they hiring right now. Is it all engineers? Is it all salespeople? Is it all marketing people? Is it all operations people? Um, and just try to get a flavor for what they're doing. So you're just trying to get a basic sense of um, you know, what's, what's the elevator pitch for this company? What's their mission statement? What are they trying to accomplish? So you can think about how you can help them accomplish those things. Mm -hmm. um, so that's, that's the first phase of preparation is preparing for that positioning. So you can position yourself as sort of the solutions, their business problem. Uh, and the second one is um, on the salary negotiation front. I like to bring this all the way forward to the preparation phase for interviews. Um, prepare by not disclosing your current or expected salary. Uh, when you talk to the recruiter or the hiring manager at first, that will usually come up right away, maybe even in the pre-screen. Um, and if you're not ready for it, it'll catch you off guard. And a lot of times as a job candidate, what you're thinking is, what do I have to say right now on this call to get my first interview? Mm -hmm. what, whatever I have to say. And a lot of times, if you're not ready, the answer to that question will be, I would like to make $120,000 or whatever that number is. Yeah. Uh, and that may turn out to be the, the wrong thing to say. Probably almost always will turn out to be the wrong thing to say. So that's the second layer is just be ready to not disclose your current or desired salary. Um, you know, I'll share a link to an article, a very long article um, that you guys can share on that later. Okay. Uh, but those are the two things. Prepare for positioning by doing research and get ready to not disclose your current or desired salary. So, you know, when we, we talk about interviews, there's a lot of different kinds of interviews that we could go in, come into. They could be full of brain teasers. It could be whiteboard exercises. I've been in some that are like, tell me about a time you've been in an awkward uh, position and how you overcame it, uh, or even questioning ethical issues. How how can we know to be ready for each one of these without just totally exhausting ourselves ahead of time preparing? That's a really good question. I like that question a lot um, because the answer I think is actually pretty simple. Uh, a lot of times the answer is just ask the person who's shepherding you through the hiring process what's going to happen. Um, so if you're talking to a hiring manager or to a recruiter who's working with you, say, what's the process look like, right? So they're talking to you, they do the pre-screen, they say, great. We're going to set up your first interview. And then you say, you know, if you don't mind, just give me a sense of what's going to happen to, you know, will I have a technical interview? Will it be a whiteboard interview? When will it happen? Um, about how many interviews should I expect if I, if I get all the way through the process? Will you bring me on site? 
And so a lot of times they'll just tell you, this is what our interview process is. And then you know which of those things you need to go focus on and which ones maybe you can discard and not exhaust yourself spending time on. Um, so that, that would be the first thing is literally to just ask the person that you're in contact with at the company what, what happens next um, so you can prep. I'm just thinking, so you, you actually, so you offer, I know we mentioned this in YouTube, but you, you offer consulting for, for this type of thing, right? Through the whole process. Yes. Uh -huh. <sighs> That's pretty cool. <laughs> like, yeah. I'm just thinking I, like that, that would have been so much less stressful having, <clears throat> having you kind of coaching me through this whole thing. So this isn't like an ad for, for you, but I mean, it really is. Cause that, that it's just <laughs> the, the stuff that you're mentioning is, yeah. is super insightful and, and it's like really simple too, but you know, it's a, it's just a stressful time. I mean, it's like when every time that I've, you know, purchased a house, it's kind of the same thing. And what ends up happening is, you know, like we'll, we'll make an offer and then we get a counter offer. And my wife is going, accept it. I need this house. I need this house. <laughs> um, <laughs> and she's like, yeah. just accept it. That's a good, that's a really good counter offer. And like every single time I've made another offer and, you know, gotten a, a certain amount off in some cases a lot. And then mm -hmm. she's like, oh, you, you were right. You know, so I was kind of coaching her through that whole thing. And I was, I kind of had that, that level head, but you know, some people just can't, some people just get really stressed out and emotional. I mean, cause it's a big deal. Like this is like changing your life and, and having, having somebody like you there, that's, that's pretty darn cool. Like that's a really cool service that you offer. Yeah. And it's, it's a lot of fun for me too. I mean, yeah. that's the interesting thing about it is I really do like uh, what I do and the stress that you mentioned is real. I mean, I've experienced it, right? I've hired people. I've seen them yeah. experience it. And, and probably a good portion of what I do is really just being an objective person to go along for the ride with you and to kind of talk you off the ledge when you're yeah. you know, inclined to just accept instead of countering. I can say, you know, the best thing for you to do right now is just wait one day and then do this thing. And there's, then they're like, ah, oh, are you sure? Like I haven't heard back from the hiring manager in six hours and I sent over this email and I say, it's okay, it's fine. The hiring manager is out to lunch and then he's got meetings this afternoon. He's going to get back to you tomorrow morning. Um, you know, just stuff like that where, um, because I've been through it so many times personally, I've been a hiring manager and I've coached a bunch of people through that process that I, I know what's coming. So to my clients, sometimes it looks like I'm, you know, using magic or something to yeah. predict the future, but really it's just almost every company's hiring process is like every other company's hiring process. They look yeah. really similar. Yeah. Um, and so, it, you know, it's, it's, it is, it's fun for me to, to help people kind of know what's coming and give them, uh, tips and tactics and sometimes really, really hard tactics that they can use that'll move the needle for them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Speaking of hiring processes, I mean, as somebody who also does interviews, I mean, we have all these different techniques that we can employ to evaluate uh, the interviewees. Do these techniques even work? Are we hiring the right people for our business? I mean, what what, what do you see from your position? I see. I like that question a lot. And I'm yeah, also you need, you, need to, you need to do consulting on the other side, too. Like, how do I actually <laughs> find, you know, figure out who is actually good? Yeah, I think a lot of it would would probably involve paring back. I'm trying to be diplomatic, paring back some of the stuff that we like to do. I think a lot of the interview process now is uh, probably half of it sometimes can be like the interviewer just trying to kind of prove that they know what they're doing. So like I'm going to ask you this really hard brain teaser because I know the answer and you might not. And that'll make me kind of feel good, yeah. which sounds crazy. Like if you're trying to run a business and that's you're, you're using your ego to sort of, you know, pet your ego while you're interviewing, that seems unwise, but I think we right. do a lot of it. Also, I, I mean, think it's hard. I mean, uh, another thing to maybe clarify this a little bit more. I mean, some of the technical things are easy to evaluate. You know, it's easy mm -hmm. to say like, do you, do you understand this technology? You can yep. figure that out pretty easy. And then it comes to like team fit. And I, I'm always yep. kind of torn on this because do you want somebody who's going to just totally mesh with you? Or do you want somebody who challenges your assumptions on things? I mean, so it's, to me, I go back and forth on some of those as well. I think the answer to that question is it, it depends, right? I don't think there's a solid answer, but I think that you should have the answer to that question before you interview people. So you might, it depends on your, the makeup of your team. You might need some people to come in that are just going to contribute to the team that you're going to, you know, especially if you're working, you know, co-located in an office. Um, I think a big part of those fit interviews is just, do I want to come in and talk to this person for eight hours a day, five days a week? Are we going to mesh or are we just going to butt heads all the time? Um, on the other hand, you might have a pretty cohesive you know, homogenous team and you need somebody to come in who's going to challenge the status quo, who's going to push back a little bit and who's going to challenge what you're doing so that you don't constantly just keep making the same kind of decision over and over. And so I think that the answer to your question is before you interview the person, know what you're looking for. So am I looking for somebody who's going to come in and be more like this team and be a really good fit 
and just like everybody else, or am I looking for somebody who can come in and challenge the status quo and maybe help us take a different direction with some of these decisions that we're making lately? Um, and then you can ask questions that will help to suss out whether they're that kind of person or not that's a good fit for you. Um, in general, the fit part of the interview process is the part that I think matters the most. So I think you said it really well, where we can pretty easily evaluate how competent you are with technologies by reading resumes, by asking a few questions. I mean, you know, you can do a three hour whiteboard interview where you're writing pseudocode, but you know, if you wanted to figure out in 10 minutes if the person knows the technology well enough, you probably could figure it out, right? Or you could ask them to see a, a toy project they built or something. Mm -hmm. So once you know their technical capabilities, it really is a matter of, okay, well, I'm assuming I'm hiring this person for the next two or three years. And the question is, are they going to be a good fit and contributor on our team for two or three years in a valuable way? In that valuable way, it could be augmenting the current team, or it could be challenging the status quo and challenging what we're doing and pushing back and asking the hard questions. Mm -hmm. So any other tips, I mean, as a, as a person interviewing people, I mean, any other just general tips for, for interviewing people, like how to kind of put them at ease and, and to actually get the, the truth and, and figure out, you know, what, if they are the right person. I mean, I, I think that's what you mentioned is really great. Like thinking ahead of time about, you know, exactly what you're looking for. Mm -hmm. um, but how do I make that whole process better? Yeah, for me, I think, um, if you find that you're relying on some sort of a crutch, I think that's a red flag. And I think the crutches are a lot of times, a lot of these like, you know, I've, I've hired at companies where they're asking you brain teasers about, you know, if you drop an egg from this, this many stories up and, and those kind of things. And I've never under, like I don't, I, as a hiring manager even, I always try to figure out like, how could I use that question to learn something about this person and decide whether to hire them? And I never really like had a good answer <laughs> yeah, to that. Right. Um, you know, and, and so I think it's, you know, really for me as a hiring manager, I would, I just wanted to talk to the person, right? And so I would start out and ask them about themselves. What do you do? What are your hobbies? If you don't mind telling me, um, you know, how long have you been working? What's your, tell me about your career background. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm listening for two things. One of them is just, who is this person? How do I feel like I get along with them? Um, you know, I, on one hand, I'd like to say that as a hiring manager, I was confident that I could, you know, take anybody onto my team and we could make them a, a contributor. But the truth is that personalities either match or don't match sometimes. So I'm just asking questions and trying to get to know them. Also, I'm listening very carefully for, um, does this person understand what we're trying to do? And do they have a clear picture of how they're going to contribute to what we're trying to do? And so that's where I do like some of the questions. I don't like the trick questions. Uh, occasionally I would ask sort of a trick question or a gotcha question, um, but usually I would ask them pretty straightforward questions like the old, you know, tell me about a group project that you worked on. What was your role in the project and what did you accomplish? And what I'm listening for is, a little bit of the technical stuff that they did, but mostly I want to hear them talk about what their role on a team looks like and how they understand their role on a team, right? Are they saying, well, I just kept getting assigned stuff and then I did the stuff, okay? Well, that is probably not a self-starter. Um, do we need a self-starter right now? Or they're saying, well, my role on the team was this, and I was very focused on the outcome for the clients that we were building this thing for, and here's the outcome that I was pursuing. Um, and so that's where, you know, kind of tying this together with my positioning uh, talk earlier, um, that's why I coach people to do that on the other side of the table is when you're answering interview questions or when I'm asking an interview question, what I want to hear is the factual answer to the question I asked you along with something to indicate to me that you understand the business impact or business value of the thing that I'm asking you about. Mm -hmm. So if I ask you about a group project, what I want to hear back is what was your role in the group project and how did you contribute and what was the impact of what you did on the project as a whole, on the group, on the client, if there was a client. If I ask you about a challenging situation, it's the same thing. I want to hear you think through not just the challenge that, you know, we had a personnel problem where I really couldn't work with this person. And so here's the solution. I want to hear your understanding of how that challenge was overcome in a way that added value to the project, that added business value. Because that's ultimately at the end of the day, if I hire people as a hiring manager who understand the impact of their work as opposed to just checking things off a list, that will make my job easier. And I'll know that my team is constantly thinking about business value, even if I'm not looking over their shoulder. Now, during the last couple of minutes of an interview, normally what I see is, you know, that's when uh, interviewees have a chance to ask questions back to the interviewer. How should we best be utilizing this time? I love this question. So um, the, the first thing is that you should be thinking uh, two things as an interviewer. One is, how can I demonstrate my competence and my understanding of business value? Two is, am I going to have enough fodder for good answers in the next interview that I have? And so I, that's a great opportunity for you to do more research. So you can only do so much research. I mentioned earlier all the research. It's like on Google and reading 10Ks and learning about the business from the outside. 
Now you have an opportunity to ask a hiring manager or one of your potential peers a question that whose answer could give you uh, fodder to answer future questions better. So you ask them, uh, uh, the hiring manager, what's the biggest challenge facing this team right now, right? Not only does that demonstrate my own, again, I'm focusing on what I'm showing them that I understand the business value of the things that are happening, right? So what's the challenge for the team? They tell you the challenge. In the next interview, you now know the, the team's greatest challenge. So you have time between interviews to think about how would I solve that challenge? That's how devious. My... <laughs> it's great though, right? You're cheating. Like, great. <laughs> no, that's great. awesome. You're, just, feel doing, it, you're just yeah. doing research, so you know? Good. It's so good. Yeah. So, I, I mean, and then when the next time you're talking to somebody, they ask you maybe just a completely generic question. All of a sudden, you tell that person, well, I happen to know that your biggest challenge as a team right now is this. Here's how I would resolve that problem using my expertise or using my role. And now, because again, as hiring managers, we're looking for people to solve problems. And so this person comes and says, I know what your problems are and I have solutions for them. Of course you want to hire that person, right? As opposed to the generic resume that's just crammed with every piece of technology they've ever touched. Yeah. Wow. Okay. So <laughs> let's get into, let's get into the negotiation phase now. Um, and, and whenever, whenever you're talking earlier, I was thinking of, um, uh, what was the book? You might know what the book was, Carl, but there, there was, uh, uh, man, I, I should have looked up what the, what the book name is, but one of the chapters in there, they were talking about real estate agents. And I, I see a lot of parallels to like buying and selling a house. Cause you're kind of buying, buying and selling yourself. I guess that sounds bad. Mm -hmm. Uh, but you know, you really are like you're, you're selling your, your, your problem solving abilities in exchange for, in, in exchange for money. Uh, but what the book was saying was that real estate agents on average sell their houses for significantly more than for their clients. Um, and I think mm -hmm. part of it is like they're kind of cool under pressure. Um, also, they they just have a better understanding of how the system works. And and essentially what they were doing is they were holding out for for better offers like they were. Mm -hmm. They just they knew how to play the game, basically. Um, just that that knowledge really, really helped them uh, uh, to that. Uh, Freakonomics, that was the book. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I think there's 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 some parallels there. Um, but anyway, so let, you know, we'll, we'll kind of talk about negotiation here. So I guess the, my first question is, how do you think this varies from, from company to company? I know you made a comment earlier that sort of, it seemed like every company was kind of the same, but, um, like how much variation do you actually see in this phase? Yeah. So I think most companies are the same in terms of their quote unquote hiring process. Mm -hmm. Um, so if you just sort of become a potential candidate for, you know, Acme Corp or company XYZ or whatever, the process that you go through to the point where you get a job offer will probably look very similar if that company is Facebook or if that company is like a mom and pop software shop down the street. Right. Um, That's interesting. Uh, you know, they all it's you know, there might be a more intense technical interview or maybe Facebook will fly you on site. But you're going to go through a pre-screen where they're just trying to figure out, like, are you a decent fit? Mm -hmm. Are you interested in this job? They're going to set you up with your first interview, which is probably not going to be the hiring manager. It's going to be a peer or somebody else. They're going to go through a couple more interviews. Eventually, you'll land at the hiring manager. Then they'll decide if they want to bring you into the building or on site. Once they've done that, then they make their go no-go decision. Um, there may be a technical interview stuffed in there somewhere, and then you'll get a job offer from the recruiter. Um, that's pretty universal. But yeah. there are some differences I found in the size of the company in terms of what the negotiation looks like. And um, what I find is that the smaller the company, sort of the tighter the window that you can negotiate. Um, I think that's because the smaller companies just have smaller budgets um, and they're much more cost conscious uh, in the short term. Whereas larger companies like Microsoft or Facebook or Amazon, um, I think that they have, first of all, just a lot more money sloshing around. And if they find good talent, they want to scoop it up and leverage it. Um, but I also think that because of the way kind of back earlier, we talked about market research um, that companies have to do and how intense that market research is. So imagine you're like a, a small business local, you need to hire one software developer, go do the research, you figure out about what you should pay that developer, you hire them, you bring them in, you negotiate with them. So you can do that research. Now imagine that you're an enormous corporation, you're hiring, you know, literally thousands of people a month, right? And you're trying to figure out how much you should pay that software developer. Well, the first thing you have to do is just build in some really broad ranges that you might pay them. So if they're a mid level software developer with this kind of experience, we'll pay them somewhere between 100 and $160,000. Mm -hmm. And so that huge range is an arbitrage opportunity when you're negotiating. There's just more room to move with those bigger companies. So that is a difference in the negotiation. The process that I follow is more or less the same, but it's important to know that at bigger companies, 
I am more comfortable pushing harder at bigger companies because they have more at their disposal to work with to bring the right candidate in. And of course, my candidates, I've taught them positioning. I work with them through this. So they're a very appealing candidate. The company's mindset is, what do we have to offer this person to bring them into the company as opposed to what's the minimum number we can throw at them to bring them on board? Those are different yeah. numbers. That's very interesting because my, my experience is actually quite a bit different. So, hmm. you know, if you have, if you're working in, and maybe it's just different in theory and maybe not practice or maybe the other way around, I don't know. So I'll, I'll kind of explain to you <laughs> uh, my experience. So, you know, you, you go to this, this small, this like really small company and, and you mentioned budgets are tighter. Like I, I understand that, but at the same time, you know, we talked to earlier about this process of figuring out, you know, we have this problem and here's how much money we have to spend on it. I feel like those smaller companies, first of all, they have, they have a, they're, they, they tend to have a lot weaker talent pool. So like, mm-hmm. you know, I, I remember, um, it was actually the first like job that I actually got in the industry and, uh, and we needed to find uh, somebody else after I was there after a few months. And I said, I said, oh, just go back to the the, the university, you know, like the because they, they send out these postings and like, we'll get this new pool of people. And they were like, uh, well, actually, like only two of you applied. And sometimes we have zero, uh, <laughs> you know, so yeah. so like they didn't have and this was like for a paid internship. And they, so they didn't have like they had almost no choice but to hire me a, at the time. Um, now. I could have in that case, like it was a very fixed amount, but at the same time, then when I, when I did go come on full time, I know that they wanted to pay me much less than, than, than what I was looking to get. Like I had mm-hmm. a number in my head and I, I knew that competitively it made sense from their standpoint. They didn't have this army of market research. Like they just said like, eh, you know, this is usually about what we pay new people uh, right. and you're new and <laughs> you know, this is how much experience you have. So like, this is, this is our first offer. And it's like, no, that offer sucks, you know, and here's why. Um, so, you know, they had a lot more latitude and kind of as, as I went up in salary, um, still working at kind of small and medium companies, um, the latitude always got a little bit bigger and it was always kind of the same thing. They're like, well, this is what we thought this would be worth, or this, this would be worth. But, you know, they're like, we really don't know what we're talking about. Like we're not a big company. And then, and then to kind of contrast that, you know, now we work at Microsoft and I, I don't want to give away like too many details, but kind of from the from the surface level, I mean, whenever you apply for a position, a lot of times it's posted at like a particular level. Mm-hmm. Um, so all these big companies, I know Facebook and Google, they all do the exact same thing. Some of them have mm-hmm. more levels, some have less, but they have these these essentially these bands that you get put into. And, um, you know, if you're interviewing for a certain position, like the budget has been set, like you have you have mm-hmm. about this amount. And really all you can do is kind of bounce around within within that band a little bit. And, you know, sometimes there's just not there's not a whole bunch of uh, of latitude in there. Now, obviously, as you get into kind of the higher positions, um, I think they, there's there's probably more latitude, um, especially like once you once you get to these ones where you're kind of in like the executive level, I think like all bets are off then like it just mm-hmm. it's just anarchy up there. But um I don't know that that's kind of been my experience. And I, I know that they, they have more money like as a, as a company and, and they're, and they have probably more, there's probably more dials they can turn. Um, I know, you know, let me, let me give an example of like a dial that they, that they really can't, or maybe they just never do turn. You know, I always had a lot of vacation at, at other companies and I worked that up over time. And then I came to Microsoft. I mean, whenever you start, um, you know, you get a certain number of weeks and like it's, it is what it is. It really doesn't matter who right. you are. Maybe at the executive level again, that's that's different. But like, you're like stuck with that. Like, if you're trying to negotiate more there, they're like, no, they, we just we just don't do that. So I don't right. know. It just felt like there's certain knobs that they aren't able to turn. There's maybe some other mm-hmm. ones where they're like, well, maybe we could bump this up to the next level, and and then you'd be sort of in this range, and we can sort of adjust that. But that's been my experience. But again, it's not extensive. Like I haven't I haven't talked to you know like five big companies. So I'm kind of curious what what you think of that with this new information with what you said. Yeah. So I'll say one, one thing that you said stood out to me from a recent client that I was working with, which is Microsoft actually does do some funky stuff with the levels that you're talking about. Yeah. Um, and one of them that I bumped into was, uh, and I won't talk too, too much inside baseball, but yeah. for a particular job, there may be multiple levels associated with that one job, which is pretty unusual. Usually the job falls into a level is yeah. how most companies will structure it. <laughs> Microsoft will say, well, this job actually has two levels and they have different pay bands. So the, the job itself is really a combo of two, two levels is weird. Um, yeah. and that, that threw me for a loop when it happened. Um, so I think we may kind of both be right here. Mm-hmm. I think what you're saying is that the smaller company may have 
more willingness to pay a higher salary. Um, and I think what I was trying, trying to say was that once the offer is made, there may be more room to move at the bigger company because of the way they have these giant major C's and different levels set up. So right. I think we're kind of both right. I think yeah. you may be right that going to the right small company where they say, you know what, we're bringing you in. Basically, you're going to be our CTO. Like we're not going to call you our CTO, yeah. but we don't have anybody who really knows code or ops or DevOps and that stuff. And so we're going to bring you in and we're willing to pay you to essentially be our technology person. You're mostly going to be writing code for us, but also we're going to need you to help us set up infrastructure mm -hmm. and test and deploy. Um, and so you might be able to command a pretty high salary because you're wearing so many hats at that company. Mm -hmm. I think once they make the offer, um, it, I find that it's a little bit tighter negotiating at smaller companies because they usually will that come out sense, with a yeah. stronger offer to convince you. Yeah. So I think we're both, I think we're both, I gotcha. both accurate. Well, yeah, I just wanted to reconcile that. I didn't think either of us yeah. was wrong. I, I just wanted to kind no, of, no, 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 I, I didn't take it that way. Yeah, yeah. I think it's a good, I think it's a good distinction to make though, is that if you could make a lot more money if you find the right small business that has the right needs and especially if they're a nice profitable business and they're just trying to grow. Um, I think that once you get an offer, you'll find that you have more room to push and you can push harder at the bigger companies because they have more levels available, levers available. So the big one at, at, at the big companies is the RSUs. That's the magic thing now that I'm, mm -hmm. I'm negotiating with a lot of people. I mean, some companies literally will offer you only up to some base salary and then the rest of the negotiation is RSUs. And so um, there's a lot of leeway there because who knows what the value of an RSU is. I mean, I know what it is today if it vests today, but they well, don't that's vest re today. Just for the language, that's reserve stock unit? A restricted stock unit. Restricted stock unit. Okay, perfect. <laughs> right. So it's a, it's a stock that you, you essentially can sell it as yeah. soon as you get it. Um, and so, you know, there's not too much of a restriction on it, but the restriction is usually a time restriction. So you'll, you have a vesting schedule. Yeah, I was going to say it vests over a couple of years. Yeah. That's right. So it's a, it's a way that companies can offer some value to you, give you some skin in the game, and also hopefully keep you around for more than that two years that we talked about earlier, <laughs> because, <laughs> yeah. you know, maybe you invest more year three and year four or, year, or whatever. Um, so they just have more, you know, they can do that. They can offer you just cash bonuses. They've got, you know, cash in the bank. Apple's got a quarter billion or, yeah, is it quarter billion? No, yeah. quarter trillion. Quarter trillion. Oh, quarter, quarter yeah. trillion dollars. <laughs> quarter so, trillion. You know, what's that doesn't, that doesn't seem right, but that is right. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I can't, I almost couldn't say it out loud, yeah. you know, whereas like a smaller company, like they may not have that giant cash right. reserve that they can just dip into. So, um, there's just more to work with once you have the offer. Um, in both cases, I don't, as, as we talked about earlier, I, I recommend not telling them what you're after or what your current salary is so that they're making you an offer based on the value you bring to their company. In the smaller yeah. company's case, maybe that value is greater because you're going to wear more hats. Mm -hmm. In a larger company's case, maybe not as great, but once they make the offer, you might be able to push them harder because they don't know what they're going to have to offer you to convince you, but they have a lot of uh, um, tools at their disposal to try yeah. and convince you. Okay. Don't wait for users to report problems. Raygun gives you complete visibility on errors, crashes, and performance problems affecting your end users. Replicate issues in seconds rather than digging through log files or having to rely on users to report errors or crashes. Raygun gives you a window into how users are really experiencing your software applications, supports all major programming languages and platforms, and integrates with your current development workflow tools too. There's a free 14-day trial. And it takes minutes to implement. So start resolving issues in your application and check it out today at raygun.com. Okay. So how, how do we figure out what we're worth? I know some people, so some friends of mine who say that, hey, I know what I'm making now and I, it always takes a percentage bump to go. Or, I, mm -hmm. or they come up with an arbitrary number. It's like, I want my current salary plus this. Or, or like Jason said, I, I might want that extra week of vacation. So how, how do we figure out not only do we're worth for that base, but you know what that total compensation should be? It's a good question. So I... Actually, I'm going to tease this apart into sort of two different topics. One of them is figuring out, you know, what you're worth, which I would I usually describe as your market value. So, you know, what is your skill set and experience worth kind of in general? Um, and so I recommend a three phase approach to that. The first phase is just doing your kind of industry wide research. So this is, you know, Glassdoor.com, Payscale, Salary.com. There's a site called Paysa, P-A-Y-S-A, that I like quite a bit. Um, and you can just go on there and say, for a software engineer too at this company, uh, you know, or in this industry, what's that person get paid on average? And you'll get a really broad number that is not um, super tight, but it will give you at least a starting point. Then the next thing that I like to do is narrow that down to the region. So, you know, a software engineer too at this kind of company in the, um, the, the Northwest or the Southeast or the Northeast or the West Coast. Um, and you'll get a, a little tighter number. 
And the third one is just trying to figure out um, for that particular company, if you can, what are software engineers twos paid? And so, but then you can say, well, what is my worth to this company that I'm talking to, right? And you can compare that to like the industry-wide uh, worth that you came up with. So, so that's a really quick and dirty kind of way to get sort of what I call your market value, which is, you know, at least a proxy for what you're worth. Um, the second one is the question of, you know, and what should I command in order to take this job? I call that minimum acceptable salary. It's a pretty key number that we haven't talked about yet, but it, I actually prefer that my clients will set that number before they get an offer. Um, in other words, how good does this offer need to be when made or when negotiated to convince you to take that job? Mm -hmm. um, most of the time, that's a base salary. So they'll say, well, I'm not going to take the job for less than 150 k Great. Now we know what our line in the sand is. If you don't get 150 k you're not taking the job. Our job is, of course, to exceed that number uh, the most that we can. Well, that's challenging so we with benefits, lines. right? So do you, do you try to equate everything into money or how does that work? Um, I typically, sometimes it's as simple as just what's the base salary got to be? Um, because that's okay. the money that you can pay your mortgage with or your car payment with, right? Um, sometimes I'll work with clients who deal with total comp. Um, I consider total comp to be not stuff including like your health care and stuff like that, yeah. um, which I realize is sort of a bastardization of the term total comp. But uh, base salary, sign-on bonus, restricted stock, uh, equity, whatever that is. You know, what's that number look like? And I try and figure it out maybe per year for them um, or they'll figure it out. So year one, my total pay will be yeah. this many dollars. Um, so those are the kind of the two, usually base salary is the one I like to focus on because that's the one that, you know, you'll get this year and next year and the year after. Sometimes you'll roll in your sign on bonuses and your RSUs and all that good stuff too. Um, uh, but I think the important thing is to figure out what number you want to use and what that number is before you get your offer. Cause once you see those numbers in the offer, your mind's going to start spinning. Right. And so it's, it, it can be frustrating for me when I ask my client, what's your minimum acceptable salary? And they say, well, I got an offer for you know, 140, and I think I can get that up to 170. You yeah. say, well, that's, that's, those are different numbers. I, I hope you're right, and I think we're going to try to do that. Yeah. Um, but I need to know, when are you going to walk away? And I think it's important from a negotiation perspective to have that number in mind so that you can comfortably walk away and say, this isn't a good fit for me. Uh, I'm going to keep looking. Okay. So then what are what are some simple strategies that, that everybody should use? I, I know you mentioned, like, you know, going in, knowing that number, Mm -hmm. Um, but like just any, any other strategies that you wanted to mention as far as a negotiation phase? Absolutely. Let me, I'll just walk through really sure. high level what that looks like. Uh, and it does, it, there aren't many steps here. Um, so first you do not disclose your current or desired salary when they ask for it. And so, um, you know, if you fast forward now through the process, you're getting a job offer. Again, you've done a good job of telling a story about how the company will be better if you're a part of it. You've induced them to hopefully make you an offer that is designed to convince you to take the job. What, what do we need to offer Josh to get him to come work for us as opposed to what's the minimum we can offer this person to get them to say yes. Those are different numbers. Mm -hmm. So you have not told them your current or desired salary. You've done your job in the interview. They're going to make you an offer that they think is competitive that will hopefully entice you to come on board. In other words, the offer they're making you is pretty close to the most that they're comfortable paying you. Probably not the most, but close to it. That's what you want. Mm -hmm. Then um, you'll compare that to your minimum acceptable salary. So that's your first decision point is, you know, did they cross that bar? If they did, you're good. You just keep negotiating. If not, you, you might need to actually say, I'm sorry, I can't accept the job for less than this salary. Let's assume that they are above the minimum. Then you're going to counter offer. Uh, I recommend 10 to 20%. The reason is, you know, you're already pretty close to what they're comfortable with. And your job now is just to figure out what's that actual number. Mm -hmm. And I found from personal experience and other stuff that 10 to 20% is a good range to counter offer to, to hopefully push them up into um, that top end of their range. 10% um, I think is closer to something where you don't sense that the company is really interested in bringing you on, but they're making you an offer. 20% is you know for sure that you're an integral part of their strategy mm -hmm. and you can contribute in a big way. You just have more leverage there. Um, once you've countered, I recommend doing that in an email and I'll share a link with you guys to a template that I have for that. Um, you counter in the email and say, I would be more comfortable at $130,000. Then almost always the recruiter is going to say, oh, thanks for responding to our counter. Do you have some, some time to talk tomorrow? And they're going to set up like a, a phone call. Then I recommend that you plan for all the increments between the offer they made you. Let's say the offer was 150 and you countered at 170. Now you're negotiating a, a base salary window between 150 and 170. Exactly. So yeah. you, you script it and you say, well, what am I going to say if they come back to me at 160, right? And my response would be, they've already shown they'll move 10,000 on salary. Let's ask them for 165, right? Um, 
And if they say no to that, then you ask for more vacation or if they're not budging on vacation, a signing bonus or more stock or whatever it is. So you plan for your, like your three top things aside from base salary. Then you have that phone call. They say, here's what we're comfortable doing. You respond to that. If they say yes to whatever you asked for, then you're pretty much done. If they say a partial yes or a no, then you say, thanks for working with me. Um, I wanted to get to 170. You only said 160. Um, can you do 160 and another 50 RSUs, right? And you just kind of try and make sure that you're yeah. getting every little bit out of the negotiation. And then you're done once you get through those two or three things. So that's the strategy in a, in a really quick soliloquy. So when, when you're making these counter offers, say you make your initial counter offer just way off base, way too high. Can you get penalized for that? And maybe they just walk away at that point? Or do you have a strategy for bringing that back in line? Uh, can is a, is a broad question. I would say maybe, but I haven't seen it happen. <laughs> Um, okay. So that's one of the benefits of countering 10 to 20 percent is nobody's going to walk away from a negotiation because you counter 20 percent. Right. Um, mm -hmm. Really, I cannot, you know, so I can't promise this. But basically, the worst case scenario is that you even if you make a ridiculous counter, so they offer you 150 and you counter at 350. Right. <laughs> and they'll say that's my uh, style, man. <laughs> yeah, like, OK, um, no. <laughs> The offer is 150, right? So, so they're not going to say, never mind, we're not working with you. I mean, they probably, I guess they could if you just went totally bonkers. But for the most part, they're just going to say, no, 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 we're not. That's you're right. I mean, you're already at that stage. Like they, they're talking to you. So, yeah, once they've made you an offer, uh, the company has demonstrated that they want to hire you. They're trying to solve a business need. They've got their pocketbook out. They're ready to write that check, right? Um, and so, it, it, I don't ever see it happen where somebody gets a job offer pulled just because they counter offer, especially at the 10 to 20 percent range. It's such a small. 10% is the bottom of that range because nobody will even bat an eye at a 10% counter offer. 20% is at the top of my range. Mm -hmm. um, it's a little bit higher, but nobody's ever going to say that's a huge counter offer, right? It's just not. Um, mm -hmm. So there's basically no penalty to counter offering and only upside, um, especially mm -hmm. if you do it correctly. So one strategy I've used, I want to get your take on this. There's this mm -hmm. uh, concept, uh, I think it's called, um, I don't know if it's centering or level setting. I can't, I can't remember the exact uh, name for the strategy, but um, if you go up to people on the street and you say, how tall is Mount Everest? Uh, mm -hmm. It's like a million feet tall, right? And they go, no, 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 no. I think it's like, I think it's like half a million. That, that's the answer you'll get. If you say, how tall is Mount Everest? I think it's like 20 feet tall. And they're like, no, no, I think it's like, I think it's like a thousand feet tall. Like by doing that, you get totally different answers. You're, you're setting the, the expectation there. Um, mm -hmm. so one thing I've done in, in negotiations in general and, and not even necessarily for jobs, but like for, for buying anything, you know, so even buying a car, um, you know, let's say the car is $20,000 and you want to get it for 15,000. I'm just kind of throwing out numbers. I would, I would actually go to them and I'd say, I was hoping to pay 10, but mm -hmm. why don't we meet in the middle? You know? So now instead of, instead of you looking like this jerk, that's like pulling the price this way, you know, really like you were here, they were here. Hey, we're, this is the middle value. There's nothing crazy about this value. It just happens to be right in the middle of what both of us are <laughs> right, thinking. Right. And it's actually Surprise. worked out pretty well. It's, it's been a good, for me, I, I feel like it's been a comfortable way of, of asking, like you don't feel like a jerk for, 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 you know, throwing out a number then. Um, I think what you were mentioning was really great. Having, 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 that foundation for like, this is 10 or 20%. But I was just kind of curious, like if, if, if my, if my tactic is like totally bogus or if that works. So in your case, you mentioned 150. Uh, so what I would do is I would say, Hey, I was actually, you know, I was, I, I kind of value my market um, value at like more like 190, but you know, I really like the company. I think I'd be a great fit. So I, you know, let's, you know, maybe, maybe we can meet in the, the middle around 170. So what, what do you think of that strategy? Yeah, I think that's interesting. Um, I've heard different. <laughs> well, it's, it's terrible. It's, sorry. I say it's interesting. <laughs> if it's out, terrible, I'm you can just, call it terrible. That's fine. No, no, no. It's it's not terrible. I think it's a good negotiation tactic in general. The thing yeah. is that salary negotiations are weird yeah. um, because there's a tremendous uh, information asymmetry. So, um, and that's actually going back. I thought where you were going was so why not just throw out the first number? You know, why not tell them your salary expectations? And well, that's that's my next question. <laughs> so I'll answer them both at the same time. Sure. The answer is because. Uh, really the question is how confident are you that you're throwing out a high number? Um, right. And so the, I like to rephrase the what's your expected salary question as uh, a company comes to you and they say, take a wild guess what we might pay somebody with your skill set and experience to do the job that we're hiring for. What do you think we're going to pay that person? Mm -hmm. And the answer is you don't know. 
You don't know how right. badly they need to fill the position. You don't know how many people they're interviewing. You don't know, you know, have they, have they flamed out on the last 17 people they've interviewed and they desperately need to hire somebody? You don't know anything about that. There's just so much information you don't have access to. So you, by waiting for them to say the first number, you allow them to say, well, here's the, the ballpark number that we're looking to pay for this person. Then you can react to that. Mm -hmm. um, in terms of the counteroffer technique, I need to think about that. I kind of like it um, there. So if you're actually hoping to counter at 170, um, uh, and you say, well, I'd like to get 190, but I'm only countering at 170. Um, I think from a psychological perspective, I kind of like that tactic. Yeah. Um, I don't know, I'm trying to think of like, would it actually have a benefit? Would it actually result in more, more dollars? Cause that's the thing that matters, right? Yeah. Well, it's worked like when I'm in buying and selling stuff, like that's, that's actually worked out really well for me. <laughs> Um, because yeah. again, it, it, it shifts, it, 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 you know, just like the mountain example, like it shifts there in their mind, you know, cause, cause if you just go to them, they're like, Hey, we'll give you 150, And you say, well, I want 170. Well, you're kind of the, the jerk for just saying like, I just want more money. Like I'm, I'm greedy. Right. But if you do right. it the other way, like, I, I don't know. And again, it might, it might just be in my head, but it's this thing where it's like, well, I wanted 190, but I will graciously accept 170, you know, because I'm a nice guy. I'm not a jerk. <laughs> and, and, uh, and like, it's worked with, like I said, when, when buying and selling things to, to help kind of reset the conversation. I feel like I'm, what I'm, what I'm struggling with is, um, who you're negotiating against. So mm -hmm. it seems like you're negotiating against maybe the recruiter who made the offer, but you're actually negotiating against a spreadsheet. Mm -hmm. Um, and so, uh, that's what I'm trying to figure out is will that oh. recruiter. So it kind of depends who you're talking to. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah. I mean, mostly that recruiter is going to hear your number and they're going to look down and say, am I authorized to pay the, the thing that they asked for? Mm -hmm. And it's a kind of a binary yes or no, or there's some gray area where they have to go get approval. Um, I do like, I do like using sort of psychology when you're mm -hmm. negotiating and the, the way that you'll, you know, my clients that work with me, I think they see this a lot is the way that I phrase things that I ask for. Um, or that I say mm -hmm. is intentionally worded to have a certain impact on the person whose ears it lands on. So that's why, you know, I hear what you say and I, I like it because I do think that you're essentially what you're saying is, look, I'm already negotiating against myself here. I mean, you know, I, I just knocked 20K off my asking price because yeah. I'm a nice guy. Um, and I think that is an interesting tactic. Like I haven't used it before, but I do kind of like it. Um, I suspect there are situations where it's probably going to help in situations where it'll just kind of not matter. Yeah. Um, that's my, that's my sense for it. Okay. I like it. Though. I think yeah. in general negotiating stuff, I, I like that tactic a lot. Um, because if you're negotiating against people, right. And if you have a pretty good understanding of what it is that you're negotiating the value. So you're in your car example, Kelly blue book tells you exactly what you should be looking for. Right. And mm -hmm. so if you're trying to get a deal, um, then you can try and use psychology to, um, help bring that person around to your perspective and get them to charge you less for it. Yeah. Um, a little tougher with jobs because you don't necessarily know even as much as you might think you know when you're negotiating. Yeah. All right. So moving on, you know, we've got the job, we've been there. Now my first performance review is coming up and they bring up, you know, a, a raise. How does this kind of negotiation differ from the negotiation we originally did right after the interview? You don't need a raise, Carl. We brought you into 170. That was so <laughs> generous of us. So wait a couple of years till everybody catches up. Well, Carl actually said, I would like 190, but I'm going to take 170. So yeah. then Carl would say, no, 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 but I wanted 190. Let's do that. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> now you're just making Remember? fun of me. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah uh, so they're totally different uh, is the truth, right? So they're both, I think, quote unquote, salary negotiations in the broadest sense of the term. Uh, one of them is, first of all, uh, an opportunity to negotiate with somebody who you probably won't work with every day. Sometimes you'll negotiate your salary with the hiring manager or the owner of the company. Usually it's going to be sort of an intermediary recruiter, internal recruiter of the company. Um, but even then, just the way that you negotiate your starting salary, um, you're taking advantage of a bigger opportunity. I think there's just more sort of arbitrage there, more to take advantage of, um, and it's a different process. Mm -hmm. Whereas when you're already at the company, I see uh, asking for a raise, which again is a salary negotiation of sorts, as more of a collaboration with your manager to try and find um, a good value uh, for the work that you do that you can both agree on. So my process for that, uh, I developed this exclusively as a hiring manager when my team would come to me and say, I want more money. And I would say, that's not enough for me to get you more money. I can't do it that way because finance is going to want to know why I want to give you more money. So here's what I need from you. So the things that I said that I needed from them were a target salary. I need to know what they're after, what's going to make them happy. Um, 
And that goes back to the market research that we talked about earlier. So you can do your market research and just get a basic idea of what should I be paid for the work that I'm doing. Um, my sort of broad statement on uh, what your market value should be or what your target salary should be is you're looking to see if you can capture some of the value of the, the work that you're doing that was unanticipated last time your salary was set. So in other words, you're adding value. You're not already being compensated for that value. Um, and you're doing additional things and you're just trying to capture some of that value in your paycheck that you're bringing to the business. So you set your target salary. This is, you know, I'm currently at 170. I think I should be at 190. So that's step one is giving your manager a tangible number to hold on to so that you can have a real conversation about that number. Asking your manager, you know, please give me more money. It's just not productive because your manager is busy. And for all the reasons we mentioned earlier about why companies aren't continuously resetting salaries to market values, it's because it takes effort. And so you want to give your manager everything they need to get you the raise that you want. And that means doing all of the homework for them. So all they have to do is just go run it up the approval chain. So you start with your target salary. Then you want to get a list of your accomplishments. What's the stuff that you've done to add value to the business that was unanticipated last time your salary was set? So maybe you've taken some reporting off of the manager's plate that you work for, or you've taken on new projects, or you're, you're managing a different part of the business, or um, you're just more efficient. You're writing better and more code than they anticipated, or you're mentoring some people. Mm -hmm. Whatever those things are, articulate them, sort of like we were talking about with the resume earlier. Um, what have you done that's valuable, that wasn't anticipated last time your salary was set? And see if you can ascribe some sort of business value to it. You're asking for more dollars, so it really helps if you can demonstrate that you're bringing in more dollars than expected to justify the dollars you're asking for. And then the last thing is your accolades. Um, again, managers are busy, they got a lot of stuff going on. Maybe you're doing great work, but they haven't actually directly observed it or noticed it. Um, that can be frustrating, but find people who have noticed it, clients um, that have said, Josh does really great work, he really knocked it out of the park on this project and he got us in two months under budget, right? Or um, awards that you've gotten, things that other managers might have said if you have a dotted line manager. And so you would just wanna document you know, four or five of those things. So now what you have is a case that you can present to your manager and say, I would like a raise to $190,000. The reason is that I'm doing these four activities that weren't anticipated when I was given my current salary or hired into the company. Those activities have this business value in dollars, hopefully. And oh, by the way, other people have noticed the work that I'm doing. Here are the awards that I've gotten. Here's some emails from clients that show that I'm doing good work. Can you help me get this raise? Mm -hmm. And so that's the, the high level how I think um, is best to ask for a raise. You know, notice that it's very, you're requesting, you're collaborating, you're not saying I counter offer, you're not doing those things because you're trying to work with your manager to find that fair value while maintaining that relationship that you have when you work with them every day. Okay. So I, I've worked at an employer that has, you know, you mentioned before that Jason's technique used psychology. I noticed that a previous employer of mine used psychology against me in this in this scenario mm -hmm. too. They yeah. came to the to the uh, uh, to the negotiating table saying, "This is the percentage we want to give you a raise. It's larger than everybody else. It's printed on paper. It looks like it's all said and done. It's framed. Um, <laughs> yeah, 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 just about. <laughs> and 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 I realized that you know, even though it. I mean, that really puts something, you know, it's concrete, it's physical. Um, it makes it seem like it's yeah. it's done. But I found out there was room for negotiation here. How do we get around when, when we are in these kind of scenarios to kind of realize that, hey, you know, we are in a situation where we can go back and forth and it's not as concrete as it looks? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, and I get this one a lot. Um, it's hard uh, to negotiate once they've once they've framed it and put it in front of you. It's really hard to or, negotiate or that. Laminated and it. Yeah, <laughs> laminated it. Whatever they did, you know, they've gotten the, the, your manager has literally tattooed that number on on their arm. Um, <laughs> it's it's hard. In your case, you mentioned that there actually would have been room to move. A lot of times, there's actually not room to move because of what we talked about at the very beginning about you know they had everybody gets five percent. And so that means if I get 7%, somebody else gets 3%. And so that's sort of how it works. So you can sort of push and pull dollars from somebody else. Um, so let me come back to that situation where there actually is to maneuver. My preference is to initiate this process on your own and to do it at a time when there might be budget available for you to get an exceptional raise as opposed to the sort of boilerplate merit increase that you would get at you know 3% or 5% or whatever every year. And so I think it's better to say, there are two scenarios at most companies. Either it's a focal process, which means everybody in the company is eligible for that annual small raise at the same time. And so all the budgeting is broken down and you know everybody gets 5% and we're gonna meet it out. Or it's an anniversary-based process where you know it, on the anniversary date of your hire is when your compensation is evaluated and you get the performance review. 
that's a little bit easier. But in general, what I would do is just look for six months off of the peak of those cycles, and that's when you should go ask for that exceptional raise. Because then there's a whole separate process for dealing with raises outside of the normal performance review cycle, and that often will come with the ability to pull budget and money in that wasn't necessarily there during the performance review because everybody gets 5%, and that's the budget. Um, so that's my first thing is just take control over it, be proactive, look for a time when there might be budget available when they're not already giving out raises to everyone, and that's the time to go talk to your manager and say, I'd like a raise of 10%, which is exceptional, but let's talk about doing this off cycle. Um, there is an opportunity, I think, sometimes if your manager shows you, uh, you know, we're going to give you a 3% raise. I think if you have already prepared for that and done the research I talked about in terms of knowing what your value is, you can make a solid case. I think it's totally reasonable to say, I really appreciate you offering me a 3% raise, but I was actually just about to approach you to talk about getting a raise, and I think uh, 8% is more in line mm -hmm. with what I was hoping for. Here's why. Can you help me make that happen? And so it's as simple as just sort of asking them, can we change this number to that number? Here's why I'm asking for that. The issue is that you just don't know how much room there is even to maneuver. Uh, they may be boxed in, and what they might hear is, I want to take 4% from somebody who sits across the aisle from me. Um, and a lot of managers are really reticent to do that. Um, so it can be challenging. But that's how I would approach it. If there is room to move, that's how you would find out there's room to move. A lot of times your manager will say, I, I can't do that right now because i got to rob Peter to pay Paul there. So can we talk about this again in 90 days, and we'll see if we can do it off cycle. It is pretty easy to change a three to an eight, you know, just saying. <laughs> uh, <laughs> even if it is a tattoo, you could just get another one over top of it. Uh, yeah. So, yeah, I wish we could keep talking about this for a few hours, but we do have to move on. So, Carl, what do you have for Dev Tip of the Week? The Dev Tip of the Week I got off of Twitter from Nick Craver. We've mentioned him a bunch of times on the show. Definitely follow him, Nick underscore Craver. Uh, not the other one. I've made that mistake before. <laughs> but uh, uh, he mentions that if you're trying to track down where code is being called from, if you've got like a, a, some sort of logging or whatever, don't forget the caller member attributes. And I'll have a link in the show notes going to where those are. But those will um, are some parameters which you can take in that'll give you uh, the file path, the line number, the member name or function that was called that got you there. And what's really cool is in the IL, so if you like dig into the code and find out the IL, this is not using reflection. It's not going to slow down. These are baked oh. in literals in the IL. So if you look, like you can't actually obfuscate these. They're in there. So it, it's it's really performant um, way to kind of get this information. And it really does help make a, a lot of, uh, you know, make it a lot easier to find what you're looking for, especially if you use it in a logging scenario. Okay, Josh, I need you to pick a number between one and four inclusive. And no, you can't negotiate between one and six. <laughs> <laughs> Can I pick a number up to ten? Uh, my number is three. Okay. Uh, would you rather be a bull rider or the clown that tries to get the bull's attention? Oh, uh, I think I would rather be the clown. <laughs> you heard it here first. <laughs> I'd rather be the clown. <laughs> I want to be the clown. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that scares me. I think being on the bull makes me nervous that I might end up paralyzed for the rest of my life. Yeah, it the seems horns like the are, are facing less likely. Up. Yeah, there's a lot more danger there. Yeah, the clown. You could, you could, you could stay far away being the clown. I think. Yeah, you could be like a really passive and ineffective clown as well. <laughs> yeah, just, you just be a job. terrible clown. <laughs> <laughs> just leave. You got it, buddy. <laughs> okay, yeah, Carl, pick luck. a number. I'll take number four. Number four. <laughs> what? As a boy, <laughs> would you rather have your grandmother's first name or have her hair cut? Boy, <laughs> I guess that means I would have hair. But in, in either case, in either one of my grandmas, that's some... some, some is it going to be like permy. a perm? Yeah, yeah it's going to be perm. It's old grandma. So I'll go with the hair. Carl with a perm. It's probably like... I don't know. So it, both my grandmas had some uh, pretty German old-fashioned names. Yeah. So my one grandma was Bernetta and the other one was Hildegard. So <laughs> they're just going to think you're way ahead of your time with that, with yeah. the hair. That's like the, that's like probably the new hipster thing for all I know. It probably is. It'd yeah. probably go good. With, I'd have to grow out the beard a little bit warm, make it bushy and then I could really rock it. Yeah. So uh, Josh, where can people find you? So uh, you mentioned Twitter earlier. That's the easiest way to get in touch with me for okay. sort of real time questions um, at Josh duty on Twitter. Um, also, uh, we've talked about my coaching. You can learn all about salary negotiation techniques and my articles and all that good stuff at fearlesssalarynegotiation.com. 
That's okay. where you can uh, learn about coaching and my book and all that, that stuff. So Twitter and fearlesssalarynegotiation.com. One thing I really want to add into that too is I was looking through your blog, joshduty.com, and mm -hmm. I found, I, you know, I was kind of addicted once I started reading those blog posts. You <laughs> have a way of kind of taking some of the, like, the most common experiences that kind of everybody has and showing the lessons that we can take, not just in, you know, for our, you know, our personal lives, but kind of take these into uh, career and business areas as well and pull lessons out of that. So that was one thing I really enjoyed as I was getting sucked into your blog posts. Awesome. That's very kind of you to say. Thanks for saying that. Yeah. I'm gonna have to read through some more of that. Uh, so Carl, where can people find you? You can find me on Twitter at Carl Schweitzer. And you can find me at ytechie.com or on Twitter at twitter.com slash ytechie. So, Josh, thank you so much for coming on here and talking about this timely topic, uh, you know, since it came up of uh, negotiation and resumes and uh, uh, interviewing. It's all great stuff. Yeah, thanks for having me on. It was a lot of fun, guys.